Hi there, my name is Zane Olson, and uh, I recently released this uh, short film that's on screen right now, Star Wars Relic Part 1. Uh, it was made entirely in Blender, entirely in CG, and because of that, I've had a few people in the comments asking me if I could do a tutorial or a little bit of a breakdown into how I made it. Now, this isn't going to be like a standard tutorial online. This isn't going to be like a step-by-step -step on how to make something like this. You know, this took just about five months to make. Uh, I learned a lot in the process, but there's a lot in here that I probably did wrong. You know, <laughs> I've only been using Blender for just a little bit over a year now. Uh, before that was more in the uh, compositing side of the vi visual effects world in After Effects. Uh, had a lot of uh, experience with Element 3D in After Effects, a little bit of experience with Cinema 4D. But because this is the first time I've really sat down and learned a 3D program, uh, there's a lot of things in here that probably aren't the best way to uh, achieve certain uh, effects. And because of that, this isn't going to be a tutorial. This is going to be a breakdown of my process. So hopefully uh, you learn something. Maybe uh, if you have any questions about some of the specific things, you'll be able to figure that out from other videos. Uh, but without further ado, let's get going. So the first thing I want to talk about are the rigs. And the rigs are uh, objects in the scene that are animated. In the case of this short in particular, the primary one was this X-Wing. The um, X-Wing itself was a game model, I'm pretty sure. I think it's from Battlefront. I've had it on my hard drive for a couple of years now, so I'm not actually entirely sure where it came from. But the first step in making sure that you have something that's easy to animate is to break it down into its constituent parts that you might want to animate separately from the overall animation of the vehicle. So that first step included separating the wings from the body. So the wings here share a pivot point in the center of the vehicle so that the wings can be animated along the y-axis here um, as they appear in the movies. Uh, the second thing I did was I went ahead and I replaced the R2 unit. Uh, I wasn't totally thrilled with the one that it came with because, again, it was a game model. It was uh, fairly low poly. So I replaced it with one from the Video Copilot Star Pack that was made for Element 3D. Uh, but, you know, those are just uh, OBJs, so you can bring it into Blender fairly easily. I went ahead and did a lot of work in the, in the texturing just to change some of the colors and the overall feel so that it didn't, so that nobody was tricked into thinking it was R2-D2, essentially. I wanted this to be its kind of this its own astromech. And then um, I went ahead and uh, applied a rotation keyframe on frame zero so that in the graph editor uh, in Blender, I could go in and apply noise to the Z rotation. And the Z rotation is up and down. Um, so now when I hit play, there's a little bit of animation. It follows this curve here. If I wanted to, um, I could bring the scale in or the strength up and really intensify that animation. You know, you could, you could really go nuts with it and have, have that astromech do, be doing something really wild. Um, but I wanted a somewhat realistic idle animation for when the X-Wing was just flying, uh, flying normally. Uh, and as you can see, the whole X-Wing itself is actually moving. So every constituent part of this X-Wing, that includes the pilot inside, the windows, the canopy. Um, there's af actually different sets of the canopy because I knew I wanted to have uh, this part eject. So this is its own separate separate piece. But the body and the wings and canopy pilot, all that is piloted to a single empty. And that single empty up here holds everything else in uh, inside of it so that way all I have to do is animate the empty but in fact you don't even have to really animate the empty you can animate it along a curve and I'll show you that a little bit later uh, one of the things that uh, I did for this rig that I didn't actually end up using were these right here so these are really low resolution low poly laser blasts i think they're just four yeah they're just four sided uh extruded rectangles with a really bright uh emissive texture and my thought process was i could animate this uh firing out uh of the x-wing to simulate light 
on the uh, on the X-wing itself. So the reason I never ended up uh, using this is because when the X-wing is animated and curving, or when the X-wing is animated and rotating, those laser blasts uh, don't act independently of the vehicle itself. So what I thought was a good idea actually ended up to be a really really bad idea. So when I brought this into the scenes uh, for animation, I just ended up deleting those. I never actually never actually used them. So yeah, that's the that's the X-wing model. For whatever reason, in this version of Blender, I'm using. Um, I've been having some of the some problems with the, with the other ones. There are volumes, and these volumes are these and these volumes are being driven by some uh, primitives that I have in the scenes here at each each engine, and that just gives a little bit of cone of um, of engine exhaust, and that did show up very nicely in the final video, but for whatever reason, it's not showing up very well in this one. So the next rig is the TIE Fighter. TIE Fighter is a lot simpler. There aren't wings that animate separately from the body until the uh, X-Wing actually blows it apart. Then I just went into edit mode and separated out the wing and made its own object. You can figure out how to do that in other tutorials. Uh, yeah, so I just went in and made sure that it was uh, just a decent model and it was all attached, again, to one empty. There's some lights inside that uh, make a really nice silhouette in rendered uh, mode. Just some things kind of pop the uh, the pilot out from the background a little bit. Not that he's too visible in the actual shot, but I wanted there to look like there was actually something in there when the camera was uh, at a position where I could catch that. So here we are in an actual shot. Uh, and the reason I picked this shot is because I've got both the X-Wing and the TIE Fighter animated along a environment. Now there are essentially two major ways of animating a, a vehicle or an object moving through an environment. You can have the environment moving and the uh, vehicle stationary or you can have the environment stationary and the vehicle moving. Now obviously one of those is closer to the real world but they both have their advantages. For this shot I wanted a stationary camera that was following the X-Wing moving through the scene and then was surprised by the introduction of the adversary, I suppose, of the piece, the TIE Fighter. So the first thing I did was I uh, figured out where I wanted that animation to take place. So the X-Wing moving through the scene, as you can see, almost escapes frame. And my thinking for that is that if there's an actual camera operator standing on the edge of a cliff holding a camera, uh, his reflexes might not be as quick as the uh, objects that he's actually filming. And I feel like that gives a little bit of realism. Aside from that, in the camera uh, animation, if we jump over to the graph editor, you can see that there are noise modifiers on the rotation uh, of each axis. That gives it just a little bit of handheld feeling. And that's a really good way of making your scene feel a little bit more grounded. My my biggest pet peeve for CG shorts or for visual effects in general is when the camera moves too perfectly. Uh, another thing I did for this is I started the shot way earlier than I knew I was going to be needing. And the reason I did that was just to give myself some leeway in the edit. I wasn't entirely sure how things were going to go with music, so I gave myself essentially a, a full second, 27-ish frames, 27, 28-ish frames of animation before I thought I might actually jump into the shot just so that I could make it work with the music a little bit better. When the TIE Fighter comes in, the TIE Fighter does actually escape the frame a little bit. And that I did that mostly um, so that the camera felt like as if it was operated by a real person. I thought if a TIE Fighter all of a sudden flew over this guy's shoulder, he might, uh, if he wasn't too scared and, you know, drop the camera, he might be able to catch the TIE Fighter a little bit late and then show its uh, final position here. So the TIE Fighter and the X-Wing were animated using curves. Now these curves I have up here in a flight path folder. And the reason that I use curves is that if I jump into the empty that controls each of the vehicles, you can see that in the constraints panel down here, I just have a follow path set. So from the beginning of the curve to the end of the curve, I only need to add two keyframes along this offset. This offset here dictates how far along the curve that object is. So all of the rotation uh, data then, as the, as the TIE Fighter comes in and curves around the edge was applied to the empty. So there's no linear motion through the scene that's actually animated um, 
in space, that's done through the follow path constraint. The environment itself was a lot simpler than I think people realized. I got so many comments on Reddit and YouTube about how I created these environments. And honestly, the environments were probably one of the easiest things. So I went to Quixel Mega Scans, and what those are are photo scans of real objects. And not just things like tables and chairs, but larger objects like massive Nordic coastal cliff. You know, these things you can use to build out a scene incredibly quickly. Now, there were a couple hacks that I that I used to speed up my rendering. Uh, mega scans can be notoriously heavy uh, in your scenes. They can be uh, really dense models. So for this scene, because most of the environment was a good distance from the camera, and I knew that this stuff here wasn't going to be making it in the shot, because I was most likely going to be starting the shot after all of that was lost in the motion blur of the camera following the X-Wing, I ended up using all of um, these models at uh, level of detail zero. So these aren't the high poly versions of mega scans. These are the LOD zeros. The second thing I did was to ignore the majority of the uh, image textures that come with these scans and just use the albedo diffuse texture and the normal texture. That's it. I didn't use anything else. I used that diffuse texture into a color ramp to drive the roughness and a normal into the normal map to, to drive the bump. Nothing too fancy here. I didn't I didn't use displacement, I didn't use cavities, maps, I didn't I didn't use uh, ambient occlusion, I didn't use specular or metallics or any of that fancy stuff that comes with it because you didn't you don't need it. For this project I was using a 2070 uh, super graphics card. It's a it's a great graphics card, but when you start using 5 4 uh, 8k textures per environmental model the amount of VRAM needed in your graphics card uh, starts going up exponentially. So for uh, this entire scene here, I only have three instanced versions of any given model. I got one here, this guy. I got another one here. Uh, and these, I only use this two times. And then I got this guy here. And those three are instanced all the way down the line so that the graphics card only has to reference one of these models to draw all these models. If you uh, if you bring a model into Blender and you shift D, you duplicate it, but you also create a new instance. So now in this model, you can make changes to it uh, and it won't affect the model that uh, you duplicated from. But if you Alt D, you also duplicate an object, but if you start to edit this um, this model, say in edit mode and start moving faces around, it will impact every other model that was referencing that, every other model that you uh, alt D to, to duplicate. So because I knew I wasn't gonna be editing these, I just brought in the models that I needed, alt D, set up my scene as I wanted it, and went from there. I had this scene going at about a minute per frame, which is pretty good. Uh, this, uh, this whole thing was rendered with uh, TIFF image sequences and uh, that can take a really, really, really long time if your graphics card is being maxed out or if you need to jump to CPU rendering because your graphic, there's too much in the scene for your graphics card to handle. So uh, I, I wanted to keep everything as lightweight as possible and efficient and those are, those are two of the most important things. We're instancing uh, models and having a really efficient uh, texture node setup, especially for environment models that were a good distance from the camera. There are shots in the final project where I did use high poly models. Uh, for instance, this, uh, this shot here, this cliff is the same as this cliff and this cliff. Those are instance, but they are high poly models and they have a lot of the image textures. I think this one was diffuse, roughness, uh, cavity, and uh, a normal bump map. So, you know, depending on the shot, you can kind of play around with what you're working with. But another thing that adds a ton of realism is the mist. Now, there's, um, if you're looking at this shot here, you can see that there's some 
atmospheric texturing that goes into this that isn't uh, in the uh, project file. And that is found over here in your uh, layer properties, in your, in your render layers. So what you do is you turn on your miss pass here, and then in your compositing, uh, uh, in your compositing window, you get this little output here connected to your render layers. Now you can connect that to a file output through a through a color map, and what you get when you're done is you get all of your standard frames, but you also get a mispass. Now what a mispass is is a black and white image that dictates where uh, atmospherics can be composited in your scene. So let's jump over to After Effects and take a look at that. So here we are in After Effects. Uh, this is the project file that has essentially every uh, exterior shot from the project so that I could jump between compositions and copy um, things over as I needed them so that I could keep a level of uh, consistency. And also so that I wasn't uh, juggling, how many shots is this? 50 plus shot um, with individual After Effects projects. Now, uh, one thing I am doing that... Um, that is just good practice is that every time I add a new C, uh, a new folder to here, I go into the, into my, um, uh, explorer and I duplicate this and put it in a backup folder just in case this corrupts. I, I have had after effects projects corrupt in the past and it's always been heartbreaking. So make sure you're doing your backups. But if we look at a uh, shot six, a here, we can see that there are a few layers here that get us to this final project final product. So the first one and most important one is just your just your video layer. So your video layer is uh, in this case a TIFF image sequence that I just brought in After Effects. I just made a new composition. So on top of that is the miss pass. Now the miss pass is being applied to a solid layer below it with a luma mat. And what that means is if I go into that um, mispass, I can start adjusting the exposure through levels and edit where those atmospheric effects are seen. Now, the reason that this is, uh, now the, the reason that I'm using this is because these are large scenes. And if you're in a large, uh, if you're in a large scene in real life, uh, your visibility over distance goes down because there's air in the way and inside of the, you know, and floating around in the air is dust particles or anything else that might obscure your view after, after any given distance. But what it also did is it gave a lot of dimensionality to these canyons and just uh, added a lot of realism without a lot of work. So every single shot in this project that is at ground level has a mispass to, to give it some dimensionality. All right, now let's take a look at the pilot. So the uh, all the close-up shots were done, obviously, in CG. Um, my original plan was to shoot with a cosplayer with a full X-Wing outfit on green screen and composite him into this X-Wing interior that I modeled. However, COVID ruined that. <laughs> so I, I wanted this to be uh, done for May 4th. I wanted it to be done for Star Wars Day. And to make sure that happened... I relented uh, about two weeks before this, before I wanted it to be uploaded. And I thought if I, if I want to get this done, I have to learn how to do all of this, all of the close up shots um, in Blender. <clears throat> now, this turned out to actually be a little bit easier than I was anticipating. Uh, it wasn't easy by any means, but it was is easier than I thought it would be. Um, so let's take a look at that. So here we have the, the project file for. For this, um, for the uh, for the pilot close-ups. Now, there's a there's a, this project file is actually broken. <laughs> um, what I did is I is I animated the entirety of every single shot on one timeline so that I could go in and set my keyframes and export shots individually without having to jump around between project files. And at at some point, uh, his neck got bent. Um, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what caused that. I'm not exactly sure what's going on there. Um, I, I know what's going on with the camera, you know, because the camera changed from, from shot to shot. But the shots before it were finished, so I guess it doesn't really matter. Every single keyframe you see here is facial animation keyframes. 
So this is a uh, plugin for Blender called HumanGen. And HumanGen is great. It's a really easy way to create high fidelity characters within Blender. Um, but again, as with everything, there's a couple things I did that kind of, I feel, took it, uh, took it to the next level. So one of those things uh, that I did was in the skin here. Might be a little bit hard to see here is I went to a site that does AI uprezzing and I uprezzed the skin textures from 4K to 8K. And that gave me a little bit more fidelity I felt on things like the, the bump on the skin and the texturing of the actual skin. So that was the first thing. The second thing is uh, Human Gen comes with a library of uh, shape keys, static shape keys that you can animate. So these are all the shape keys here for the actual for the actual face. And as you can see, they they move around depending on what I wanted um, what I wanted his uh, facial animation to be. And uh, that, took a, that took a lot of work. That took a lot of work to get that to a point where I felt like it wasn't, uh, it wasn't stupid. Because <laughs> there was sometimes, uh, especially on my first test renders, where he, he looked absolutely horrifying. Things would move. Uh, it's weird. The human face doesn't move smoothly. It moves intentionally. It's kind of a weird distinction to make. But the difference between frowning and smiling is obviously the shape of the mouth and the eyes and what the muscles are doing. But when the muscles go from a smile to a frown or from a frown to a smile, they don't always ease into that in a smooth way. There are, the muscles can twitch, the muscles can move quickly uh, to get to uh, like a baseline and then move more slowly when it has to, when the muscles have to um, pull a little bit harder. So there's a lot of tweaking in here just to make sure that these animations looked like they were actually doing something semi-realistically. Um, and we'll, you know, there, there was a guy on Reddit who did say that the pilot looks stoned and that maybe putting some effort into facial animations would fix that. I hope he sees this because <laughs> this took, this took forever. Um, but yeah, you know, there's always more you can do and I am limited by what the, what the plugin is actually available or um, what's available within the actual plugin itself. But I think for the most part, it worked out really well. So I want to jump into another shot here. This is uh, shot 42 after the X-Wing has been hit. And there's, uh, there's some t uh, tips and tricks in this shot that I think uh, really made it successful in what I wanted to do that I thought I'd, uh, thought I'd go over here. So I as with everything, it starts in Blender, starts with the animation. The X-Wing itself, uh, it, on the uh, empty that actually controls the X-Wing, uh, as with everything, has a noise modifier uh, affecting its rotation information. And on the Y, you can see that that scale is brought down and the strength is brought up a little bit to kind of give it a kind of give it a jittery look, like uh, like the pilot is really struggling to get control there. The uh, second thing is that there is a point light that is attached to the wing, it's parented to the wing, and what that um, what that point light is doing is flickering in intensity. Uh, again, using a, a noise modifier to simulate the fire burning. Uh, the the other thing I did was I added an empty that is the location of the damage, so that what I can do is I can select that empty and head on over to export and export an After Effects uh, readable file. So what that does is that brings the camera and whatever empties I have selected in the scene into After Effects. So if you jump into After Effects, uh, what you can do is you can go to file, uh, scripts, run script file, and then you find that exported file from, from Blender. And you bring that into After Effects. And that brings in that positional information. So using that position information on the wing, uh, what I did is I is I just made it as, as simple as I could. Um, I actually used a torch element from Video Copilot from their Action Essentials uh, 2 uh, pack. And that's just this right here. And all I did was I scaled it I brought the, uh, so all I did was I brought the anchor point to the bottom of the fire and scaled it and sped it up so that it actually looked like uh, it was fire firing from, from the wing. 
So the smoke itself was created inside of After Effects using a particle system, using a, a trap code particular, an incredible uh, plugin for After Effects. I feel every After Effects user should know, um, but too in depth to really go into here. So there, there's a lot of great tutorials online. It's been around for a really long time. So there's a lot of really great material out there. But all I did was a very simple uh, particle uh, animation for the smoke and then another one for when the wing hits the hits the ground there fires up some dust yeah and that just kind of ties everything together so hopefully this has given some insight uh into how this was made for the people who wanted it like i said at the beginning uh this isn't a tutorial it's not the kind of content that i'm really interested in making but if you guys are blender artists who are looking to accelerate your learning i would recommend a lot of channels here on youtube you can find those in the description uh the most um valuable for me personally was joining ian hubert's patreon at the seven dollar level there's a lot of great learning in there and I, I can confidently say that the vast majority of what i uh what i learned in the last year uh leading up to this i learned i learned on that patreon so uh if you're interested in that it's down in the description and again um for all the people who stuck around thanks for watching and uh, i hope you enjoyed it bye bye